Good morning and welcome to Inside South Florida. I'm Dave Azer. Today, the lessons South Florida students are learning about the Holocaust and the conversations they're having with survivors. Plus, new year, new you. We've got quick and easy tips on how to improve your wardrobe and your skin. That and more as Inside South Florida starts now. Although the Holocaust happened some 70 years ago, the lessons learned are as valuable today as ever. And some South Florida students are hearing the stories firsthand from survivors. Here's Rosetta Kenningsburg, the president of the Holocaust Documentation and Education Center. Rosita, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. All right, we've got a lot to cover. Let's, let's just start with this. Tell me about the Holocaust Center. Well, the organization is non-for-profit, non-denominational. We started 32 years ago. It was amazing because our founding president was a nun, Sister Trinita Flood, who was then president of Barry University, and she had an incredible vision, and that is to bring all the college and university presidents together in South Florida and really create what you called a living memorial through education, which was something more than martyr brick and stone, which was really to change the hearts, minds, and souls of this and future generations. So the first thing we did, because our founder was a motion picture mogul, uh, he believed in the old adage of a picture is worth a thousand words, and we start to take testimonies of survivors of the Holocaust, liberators, that's men and women of the Allied Armed Forces, and rescuers, individuals who were not of the Jewish faith, who for some miraculous reason, on their own, because they were human beings first, wanted to save people regardless of race, color, creed. Has that been one of the aspects of this that has surprised you the most and touched you the most, uh, the fact that so many different people from around the world helped? It is. It is truly, um, I, I always say that they climbed the highest mountain of humanity. And what was it about them? If you take Denmark, for example, where they helped save 75% of the Jewish population, and you compare it to Poland, which absolutely helped perpetrate the murder of 75%, what was it that was so different? And when you interview a rescuer, they tell you they would do it over and over again. So something remarkable, and there's still light at the end. Talk to me about these Student Awareness Days. Um, my first question is, how much do students know about the Holocaust? Well, I would say prior to 1994, not a whole lot, and certainly there was not a lot of teacher training or any resources available. After the mandate, which passed in 94, uh, from 94 to today, I, we have to commend all the teachers in the 67 districts. We've come a long way. These Student Awareness Days are unique for one particular reason. Survivors of the Holocaust participate. We have the second largest survivor population in North America. And if you're looking at Broward County, per capita, it's number one. At every single round table, you have a survivor of the Holocaust, and you have a student that represents every high school and every walk of life. Wow. So when the survivor comes and sits down and they're looking at what does this elderly person and I have in common, and this person says to them, I was your age, a teenager just like you when this happened, suddenly my life was interrupted. Everything was taken away from me, my home, my family. This is what prejudice and hatred has done to me. How many of you have experienced it? When they walk in, they're like all over the place, but when you start that conversation and you watch the body language, they completely change. Right, because it's one thing to learn about this in a textbook and maybe Correct. see a movie. Correct. But when you're sitting across the room or across the table from somebody that's been through atrocities, that has to be the kind of thing that, that'll stay with that child forever. And that's exactly what they say. Uh, at the end of the day, when they come up to the mic and share their feelings, they talk about my survivor that they've suddenly adopted and how things in life that they took for granted uh, are not for granted anymore and they apologize for being prejudiced against other people and they tell us at home their families dislike this group, this group, and this group. They tell us their teachers really don't talk about it as much as you know talking about the hatred and the prejudice and we tell them prejudice isn't prejudice and it's going on and bullying today is also a major part of what we try to help stop the hate, stop the violence, and stop the bullying. And you mentioned bullying. Uh, I would imagine that this has a profound effect on not only people who are being bullied, but people who do bully as well. Absolutely. Uh, we have a former skinhead that comes to speak. She was bullied uh, throughout her years. She went to Coral Springs High School. She was part of the Oklahoma bombing mess, and she comes and tells them how what happened to her and being bullied and how she, her family was very dysfunctional and she was looking for a group and no matter where she went, everybody bullied her in every which and what way and therefore she became a bully. 
by being part of the skinhead group and not to do it. And they sit there in absolute awe and shock. She went to federal prison. Um, she was one of the lucky ones. She changed. We gave her a chance, uh, again, through one of her, uh, the college and university president of Broward College called me up one day and said, I'd like you to meet someone. And I always believe that everybody deserves another chance. And the woman comes and shares. She does not want her past to become the future of any one of those kids. But if that's what you have to resort to, because you have nowhere else to go. So that's a conversation that we are having nationally now more than ever. Um, I'm sorry that it takes all the death and horror to bring that conversation to the forefront, but unfortunately that's been history over the years. But you're doing some wonderful things uh, carrying on the you know, the, the education and that process. And one of the things that you're doing is, I know that you hold a contest for these students, a visual arts contest, a writing contest. Talk to me about that. It's, uh, it's really wonderful because on its own, it has a life of its own. When we first started, it was for high school kids. On its own, it went national. We had been contacted by various states across the country. And then, even further than that, it's gone down to fourth grade. So we have fourth grade entries. It's the Holocaust. Um, you know, what are the lessons? What can you remember? And on some of our, our first year that we did the contest was the Holocaust, Can It Happen to Me? And one of the young girls, uh, this was going back to 87, was the first year. What she'd taken was a piece of mirror. She put it on some wood. She had put like hanger wire across the front of it. She painted on two faces. All you saw was mirror. So when you look into that particular contest entry in the mirror, what you read is the Holocaust, can it happen to me? Or you can change it, Bosnia, can it happen to me? Any kind of prejudice, genocide, or hatred, can it happen? There's a lesson. Does anyone come up to you and say that the Holocaust did not happen? Do you still deal with deniers, whether it's a student or a teacher or a parent or anything like that? Years ago, um, some teachers didn't want to teach it just after the mandate was passed and refused to teach it. Um, I have served in other positions nationally and internationally, and we have dealt with what you call the Historical Review Institute and a group of individuals, pseudo-intellectuals supposedly, that deny, misrepresent, and distort the authentic legacy of the Holocaust. Um, it is the only genocide, by the way, in the world that is being denied. Mm -hmm. And it is also the only genocide, the Holocaust, that has the tremendous documentation that it has. So the way we deal with that, and we had an incident right here at University of Miami when the newspaper of the University of Miami had carried articles by Holocaust revisionists. And we did go to the president at that time, Tad Foote, and uh, its education is key. And if you can make people aware and why and what, ignorance doesn't go very far. As a follow-up to that, unfortunately, in 10, 15 years from now, correct me if I'm wrong, pretty much every surviving member of the Holocaust probably won't be alive, right? I mean, that day is coming. Is there a fear that once there's nobody who experienced it firsthand, are you afraid that maybe the messages won't be as powerful? No. Um, we've seen something happen a couple of years ago where in London, England, there was a phenomenal historian by the name of Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, who's from here, who uh, was taken to court by a Holocaust denier and told the Holocaust didn't happen, and she challenged him on it. It was because of all the documentation in the oral history that she won the case, because mm -hmm. in London, England, you're guilty until proven innocent, not like this country. So we know by building the museums, by these educational programs, by leaving an authentic legacy, and education, as I said, in everything is key. And then the last point is um, the museum which I know that you're, you're working on building, and there's going to be a rail car. Talk to me about that. 2007, uh, we acquired a rail car from Poland. Uh, little did we know at that time that we were actually going to identify it. It's one of nine on display in the world, and it is the only one at the moment that has been actually given a classification number. And it has transported people to their death, which we know of. Uh, we are eventually going to be looking to Bad Orlson that has some of the most incredible records in Germany and see if we can actually find out who was on that car. So when you see that car and, uh, and you hear a survivor speak, it represents the ultimate evil. And every single person who sees the car knows the story of what was done in that car by transporting hundreds of people. Because again, even just hearing this from you, it inspires all kinds of reactions. So to see it, I'm sure, would take that you know, mm -hmm. to a much different place. If people want to find out more information, how can they do that? They can contact the Holocaust Center at 954-929-5690, at extension 202, and they can certainly come and visit. We're in Harrison Street right now, but eventually we'll be moving.
Well, Rosita, this was wonderful. Thank you so much Thank for coming on. Thank you very, it's, very much. It's such an important topic, and, Thank you. and I, I hope that these conversations continue. Thank you very much, and we look forward to having all these people come and visit our new museum in Dania Beach. All right, take care. Thank you. The center will move to Dania Beach by the end of the summer, and the museum is scheduled to open within a year. And when it does, it'll become the first North American Holocaust Museum to tell its story in both English and Spanish. When we come back, a new year means a new you and a new wardrobe. Stay tuned. Mr. Harper. Call me Charlie. Don't judge me. My drunken uncle. Charlie and I are just friends. My brother does not befriend women. He befouls them. That's good. Charlie? Charlie Harper? Where? He owes me money. When I first started work here, I laid down the law. Looking, no touching. Two and a half men all week long. Weeknights at 7 and 7.30 on SFL TV.